um, sorry, just our usual thing about Western Canadian Reason Conference. Uh, featuring Susan Gerbic, who is here joining us tonight, as well as Yasmin Mohammed, who joined us for book club this month. So that was really exciting. And just in case you're not aware, we are not hosting it this May, and we're not hosting it this September like we were planning. It is going to be May 14th, 2022. So just a little reminder about that. And we are, will continue having these We Can Reason webinars every month for sure. And also we're having something really special on May 15th, which is the We Can Reason Skeptic Camp. So it's a really fun thing. It's going to be online. It's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time. There will be 20 minute talks. So fast and furious, 10 minute Q&A. Uh, about nine or 10 speakers plus we'll have a little quiz game show thing so it's going to be lots of fun so hopefully you can make it it's also free it's if you want to make a donation of course we would appreciate it but there will be no charge for that and just to, to remind everybody that we are inclusive we're kind to each other make sure that nobody insults anybody we have a great group we've never had that issue so just a reminder to be kind and to please donate just like I said any amount you can and I will be putting the link in the chat straight to the donation for atheistcalgary.com slash donate if you want to type it in yourself or go to our website and you can donate there the donate button is now at the top of the page also you can become a member I noticed a few people have been joining which is great it's twenty dollars a year so please consider joining as well and the next thing, just a reminder that during the Q&A, the question and answer, please post the questions in the chat. You can send them directly to me or you can send them to the group as a whole. It's up to you. And I will read them out. So not everybody will see your question necessarily. Read them out to the, so those listening also via the stream will know the questions. And lastly, uh, we are going to introduce to you Janice Boynton, and she's going to talk about facilitated communication holding on to a false in brackets hope. And she, I've gotten to know her through GSOW, the Guerrilla Skeptics uh, on, on Wikipedia, or Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. She is a fellow editor and she's become a friend and I'm so excited to hear her talk. I've heard her talk before. I think we're in for a real treat tonight. So thanks so much for joining us, Janice. And let me, oh, I need to make sure you uh, can share your screen. So I'll do that, almost forgot that. And I will be muting everybody. And then Janice, if you can make sure you unmute yourself, okay? Okay. Okay, three, two, one, here we go. So am I, I'm good to go? Yes. Okay. Hi. Perfect. Oh, and I was going to spotlight too, wasn't I? There we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. I, I'm set up. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I'm here today to talk about facilitated communication, and it's a technique that's been thoroughly debunked by the scientific community, but it's actually still being used on people with severe communication difficulties associated with autism, cerebral palsy, developmental delays, and other disabilities. Here in this picture, the facilitator is supporting the student at the wrist during a typing session. Many facilitators start this way, including the way I started. And this is just one variant. I will be showing you more as we go along. The technique was popularized by Rosemary Crosley of Australia and Douglas Bicklin at Syracuse University in the late 1980s, early 1990s. The promise of FC is that by simply providing emotional and physical support to the person with disabilities, as well as verbal and physical cueing, a facilitator can help the individual unlock hidden knowledge. Proponents believe erroneously that language and literacy skills do not have to be taught and that individuals subjected to FC have learned how to write complex sentences simply by having books or newspapers in their environment. Proponents claim the messages obtained using FC are quote unquote independent, while critics of the technique have demonstrated repeatedly in controlled settings that it's the facilitator and not the individual being facilitated who is authoring the messages. I was once a believer in FC, 
but abandoned it when double blind testing showed that I and not my student was authoring the messages. I've spent many hours talking with researchers and learning why FC cannot work um, as an independent form of communication, not just for me, but for anyone. I'll be sharing with you some of those insights and why I believe the messages come internally from facilitators and not externally from the individuals being subjected to FC or its variants. Um, my talk will be roughly an hour and then I'm happy to take questions at the end. In the 29 years since I was directly involved with it, FC by name at least has expanded though the technique has changed very little if at all. You'll find proponents using supported typing, typing to communicate and other creative names, largely to deflect attention away from the fact that FC has been discredited and as a way to get FC onto individual education plans in schools, often without parents realizing it. This may make educators vulnerable to malpractice suits for using a clinical fad in the classroom, but I'll leave that discussion for another day. As a general rule, FC and its variants can be identified when the facilitator holds onto their client's wrist, hand, shoulder, or other body part while typing. With evidence-based methods, some physical touch may be necessary when an individual is first learning how to use a communication device, but this is short, openly attributed to the assistant and not an essential part of the typing process. Facilitators believe they can hold on to the individual for long periods of time and still not affect the written output. You'll also see some facilitators holding on to their client's sleeve or shirt tail or touch their leg, which those, these are other common forms of cueing. Early critics of FC asked the question, who is doing the pointing? in an attempt to get proponents to address the concern of facilitator influence because of the physical touch. But rather than conducting double blind testing, proponents modified the technique and invented rapid prompting method. Speaking with eyes and eye tracking that I have listed here are hybrids that have their own issues and I'll talk about them more in a moment. With RPM and its variants, the facilitator holds onto the board while the individual points to the letters with minimal or no physical touch. In contrast with evidence-based methods, the child holds the board or the board is mounted on a stand. Here the facilitator consistently looks at the board and has control over what letters are selected. RPM shares so many characteristics with FC that uh, in terms of facilitator influence, I consider them pretty much the same thing, but technically there is a distinction. Instead of who is doing the pointing, by the way, I encourage you to ask who has control over the FC or RPM generated messages. <clears throat> Facilitators are told in their trainings that FC is a form of augmentative and alternative communication or AAC, and that candidates for FC have apraxia or motor planning problems that require support from a human in order to communicate. However, to be recognized as legitimate, a legitimate form of augmentative and alternative communication, a method or technique must allow the individual user to communicate independently that is without interference from a facilitator for, or an assistant. The facilitators are integral to how FC and RPM work. Remove the facilitator from the visual and auditory range of the individual, effect, effectively eliminating any prompts or cues from the facilitator, and the quality of the typing diminishes or becomes unintelligible. Organizations opposing FC and RPM do not recognize it as a legitimate form of AAC. And I'll show you a select list of those organizations toward the end of my talk. Um, I used a picture of Stephen Hawking here at an ALS conference sometime in the 1980s to show you that technology was already emerging to assist individuals with profound motor difficulties to independently interact with the communication devices before Bicklin introduced FC to the US in 1990. High and low tech options for AAC have expanded since that time. And according to Howard Shane at Boston Children's Hospital who worked with Hawking, there's no legitimate case for using apraxia or motor planning as an ex explanation for either the inability to point 
thus requiring stabilization or, or somebody to hold their hand or as an explanation for why a person doesn't talk. He says their clinic regularly assists individuals who can only twitch a muscle or blink an eye to independently express their wants and needs. The question then is why proponents continue to insist that individuals with autism are completely dependent on facilitators to help them type when these same individuals are regularly shown in pro FC videos, painting with a paintbrush, using utensils to feed themselves, taking photographs and picking up small objects. The question then is why is a facilitator even necessary? One of the main problems with FC in any of its forms is facilitator control over the messages. Facilitators are faced with an impossible task to prompt their clients or loved ones to participate in the typing activity, which is built into FC, RPM and all its variants and simultaneously not prompt them in a way that controls the messages. But part of what makes it impossible for facilitators not to provide cueing is a phenomenon called the idiomotor response or idiomotor response or non-conscious muscle movement. The scientific community recognized and wrote about the idiomotor response in the mid 1800s. Magicians for centuries have relied on the idiomotor response to carry out their illusions. And with apologies to magicians, why do you think they need to hold on to someone to fight an object while blindfolded if not to track their target's movements? It's still a cool trick, but it's an illusion nonetheless. Researchers have demonstrated the idiomotor response in automatic writing dousing and using a planchette. Um, skeptic Kenny Biddle did an informal experiment with friends using a Ouija board. And they noticed that after a few minutes of holding on to an unmoving planchette, someone in the group would get tired and their wrist would drop slightly edging the planchette forward, often without realizing he or she was the one who initiated the action. And I suspect this happens with facilitators as well. Um, Amiko Kazuka, wrote an article in 1997 called The Role of Touch in Facilitated Communication and demonstrated just how easy it is to influence the motion of a type response when two individuals are typing together. Minute movement is all that's needed. Holding on to a, a person's hand while typing essentially creates the same movements as using a planchette. This um, picture here is called hand over hand. It's another variant of facilitated communication. And these small muscle movements of the individuals involved cause motions or typing actions that to the participants feels like the activity is coming from someone other than themselves. Holding a board in the air produces the same effects. Had proponents done their due diligence, they would have recognized the similarities between FC and using a planchette and set up controls to rule it out before marketing their discovery to the unsuspecting public. FC, by the way, shares the same guidelines as using the Ouija board, both discourage people from testing the messages or approaching it with a skeptical frame of mind. FC is based on trust. And if you dare to criticize the technique of FC, you're told by proponents you, you risk breaking the bond of trust with the individual. Not only that, you're speaking against individuals with disabilities. These are emotional incentives to make sure that you as a facilitator are making it quote unquote work. Dicklin's 1990 article, Communication Unbound, proves that he had an awareness of FC and the Ouija connection. That article is what introduced facilitated communication to the United States. But again, he willfully or mistakenly missed the opportunity to test. He wrote, the behaviors of people labeled autistic are often unusual and appear to reflect lack of attention and or awareness of social communication cues and or severe intellectual disabilities. Perhaps it is such behaviors, including the on again, off again ability or willingness of students to communicate that caused some people to worry that facilitated communication is no more real than a Ouija board. To this, I'd say that people were less concerned about the behaviors of individuals with autism, which were well-documented and still are well-documented and much more concerned that facilitators are controlling the, the FC generated messages. 
Facilitators insist they are not in any way influencing the typed messages. They consider the messages, quote unquote, independent, even when they're holding on to the individual or holding the board in the air during a typing session. As a way to consciously experience the idiomotor effect, you might try something like the grommet shown here. The goal is to get the discs lined up in a row without having them twist out of alignment as in the image. It takes concentration to make it work. It is possible, but much harder to keep the discs aligned while carrying on a conversation. If you don't have a grommet, by the way, you can simply put a marble or two on a plate and try keeping them still while you're carrying on a conversation. It might work for a few seconds, but as soon as you turn your attention away from balancing the plate, the marbles will start rolling across the surface. Shifts in your fingers, wrists, arm, head, and body will affect the movement, even if you don't consciously feel like you're moving the plate. Here's how I believe the idiomotor response works in FC. In this picture, the facilitated, the facilitated letter is on the upper right-hand part of the keyboard. Let's say they're typing the letter I. If the facilitator believes this is the correct choice for the word being spelled, she'll tense up, stopping the sweeping or search motion and signaling to press down. Um, this tension is slight and probably not something the facilitator notices. According to a study by Daniel Wegner on uncontrolled intelligences and FC, she can't help it. Her brain signals that this is the correct letter and so she non-consciously stops. I believe facilitated messages are internal and not external and here's where the facilitator will begin to try to figure out what letter might follow this letter I. For those who do crossword puzzles, you know that only so many letters will logically follow another. This letter selection happens quickly and may or may not register consciously in the facilitator's mind. If it's the start of a sentence, maybe the logical progression would be I am, or if it's the start of a question, maybe the logical progression would be is the. So the facilitator is already formulating an idea of what words might be spelled out, even if just one letter is pressed. In any event, after the um, eye is pressed, the facilitator non-consciously releases tension and the search begins for the next letter. Both the letters A and S, for example, are on the left side of the keyboard. If the hand movements appear to be going toward the right side of the keyboard, the facilitator, believing the next letter should be an A or an S, will non-consciously tense up as the motion goes away from the target letter. If their hands swing toward the left in the direction of the A and the S, the movement will be smooth and easy until the person's finger nears the next desired letter. Then the facilitator will again tense up. She can't help it. Let's say the typing duo press the letter A and the process starts all over again. With the letter A selected, by the way, the facilitator is cleared up in her mind whether this is a question or the start of a statement. What letters follow next have to follow the logical constructs of language and literacy, which the facilitator knows, but the individual being facilitated may or may not. Though I suspect if the individual being facilitated knows how to spell a particular word already, they'd not, they would not need a facilitator to hold their wrist while they type it out. This thought process and ongoing decision-making by the facilitator happens very quickly. And I probably wouldn't have made this connection except during the double blind testing, a situation where I was more vigilant than in unstructured settings. I noticed myself at times searching for answers to unfamiliar questions. What was the color of uncle so-and-so's car and the like? I call these breakthrough moments where I, I was consciously aware that the facilitated chatter in my head, which is more like an author writing a story than anything else, differed from my own conscious thoughts. Think for a moment about a time when you were absorbed in doing art or reading a book or writing a story or watching a movie, and then you suddenly remember you forgot to put the wash in the dryer. It's like that. I think this happens to most, if not all facilitators as well, but unstructured settings, um, but in unstructured settings, the thoughts move too quickly in and out of consciousness to register. I move the kid's hand this time, but I won't next time. And you just keep going on. As facilitators, we, rem we remember the hits, times we think the messages are real and forget the misses, times we're not so sure or are simply wrong. 
We want FC and RPM to work so badly, we're willing, perhaps even primed by the training, to dismiss any doubts we have about our own influence on the activity for fear of looking like we're not doing a good enough job supporting our clients. Proponents call this presuming competence, which to them means not questioning the written output. With rapid prompting method or spelling to communicate, the influence of the idiomotor response is slightly different, but with the same result of facilitator influence. To get RPM to work, all you need is an individual willing to point their finger in the general direction of the board and the facilitator controls the rest. In the picture shown, there are several ways the facilitator can inadvertently cue the individual being facilitated to spell, spell out words. Slight pressure changes in the hand on the shoulder can signal when to move forward, backward, left or right, even though it looks like the individual is quote unquote independently pointing to the letter board. The board in the air is affected by the facilitator's shifts in body weight, how tired his arm is from holding the board, and non-conscious movements, left, right, up, down, backwards, forwards, as he helps the individual spell. He can't help it. If he knows the answer or thinks he knows the answer, he's going to direct the board where needed to make the correct choices. Having the board securely placed on a table or stand would, if not eliminate, at least reduce the problem of this type of cueing. And I'd like to point out that sometimes with these stencil-like letter boards, the pencil gets stuck in unexpected letters. Say it gets caught in the W when the facilitator is expecting the next letter to be an S. Following a facilitator's logic, this was an independent action on the part of his client. And now the facilitator is forced to continue the activity and in a split second, come up with a word that makes sense. This also happens when the wrong letters are pressed during typing. This causes the unusual spellings facilitators are told to take as quote unquote proof of independence. And I believe creates the unusual language constructs that facilitators rationalize as poetry. Facilitators believe that fading support from the wrist to the shoulder reduces the amount of facilitator control but long hours working together reduces the amount of pressure or the expansiveness of a movement needed to cue the changes. Recognizable spelling patterns develop, H often follows T or S often follows I, making the activity appear rapid and fluid. Small tugs on this individual's shirt cue him to move his arm left or right up and down or stop moving when his finger hovers over the desired letter. These cues can become so subtle they're difficult to pick up if you're not looking for them or believe they aren't there. Other phys physical cues include shifts in body weight, head nods, and less subtly grabbing the individual's arm or moving the keyboard itself. This facilitator is holding onto her son's back. You can't tell from the still image, but her eyes are almost always directed at the keyboard as a standard practice. And in addition, her fingers are constantly moving. These small movements control what part of the keyboard her son points to, left or right. Changes in pressure also signal him to move his finger down to press a letter or up to wait for the next prompt. The individual constantly looks at his facilitator for approval or reassurance, which is exactly backwards from AAC, where the assistant checks in with the individual to make sure the output is accurate. In this example of rapid prompting method or spelling to communicate, the um, facilitator holds a board in the air while her client points to letters or at least stretches her, his finger in the general vicinity of the board, sometimes without looking. As we know by now, facilitator movement and cueing is an issue whenever the board is held in the air. The translucent letter board also allowed us to slow down the video and see that the young man often pointed in between the letters with no distinct choice. The facilitator called out the names of the letters that she thought fit with the words being spelled, regardless of what part of the letter board was touched. This session at times looked believable in that the individual pointed to the board without being physically touched by the facilitator, but that's not the whole story with RPM. Facilitators can and do prompt their clients and control the type messages without realizing the extent to which this happens. Along with physical cues, 
Vocal inflections too can signal the start or an end of a word as facilitators call out the letters. The facilitator's voice goes up or stays even when he or she expects more words to come. C, A, and goes down when he or she expects the word or sentence to end. T. Recent RPM literature puts forth the idea that the rapid choices prevent facilitators from influencing letter selection. I'd argue that at times the rapidness of the pointing prevents facilitators from having the processing time to determine one, if there was a solid letter choice made, two, the name of the letter and how it fits in the word being spelled out, and three, missing the accuracy of the next letter by having to call out or remember the ones preceding it because the typing is happening so quickly. As an aside, I listened to a facilitated session once um, with headphones and the individual was pounding the letter board so hard and so rapidly, I reflexively closed my eyes. I wonder how often this happens with facilitators and how they can process the letters with their eyes closed. In addition, letter boards like this don't have a way to record the typing session. So the outcome is solely reliant on the facilitator's perceptions and memory without input from the individual being subjected to facilitation. This is a hybrid form of facilitation that claims to use eye tracking. It requires two facilitators plus the person with disabilities. Here the mom holds her son in her lap while another facilitator purportedly tracks the eye gaze of the young man and points to where he's looking on a chart she's holding in the air. The mom reads off the letters. This form of communication requires eye gazing abilities from all three participants and at a distance. The board's held in the air so the facilitator has an added problem of inadvertent movement as does the mom as she moves her son's head and neck. Howard Chain of Boston Children's Hospital told me they have four different consumer ready eye gazing systems that allow clients to interact with the communication devices without any assistance including some apps for the iPhone. And this, uh, this woman here is using an eye tracking system by herself. So the question here is why is this, the other kind of tra eye tracking I just showed you, why is that system still necessary? Also proponents of RPM are now using legitimate eye, gate, eye tracking systems to quote unquote um, prove authorship, but instead of the mounting, mounting the board on a stand as shown here, the facilitators are holding the boards in the air, undermining the efficacy of these systems by influencing letter choices with non-conscious muscle movements. Facilitators are told to analyze the written output for certain indicators of quote unquote proof of authorship, typographical errors, unique spellings, unusual word order, and that these errors in typing and syntax somehow show the individual's personality. But as controlled testing has repeatedly demonstrated, analyzing written output alone um, does not address the, the um, facilitator control over typing activity. The re revelation of content that is unknown to facilitators is a poor substitute for blinded information because one, facilitators share information all the time with each other without realizing it, and it might come out days or weeks later in a typing session. And two, we all learn information that remains dormant until needed. I attended a social trivia event the other day and occasionally, just occasionally, <laughs> um, an answer would pop into my mind, something I hadn't thought about in years, but in the context of the situation reminded me of something I knew, but had temporarily forgotten about. This happens with writers all the time as well. And finally, different levels of support is a moot point. As we've seen, queuing happens with or without touch. Current facilitators are explicitly told not to test for authorship, but researchers in the past have conducted dozens of studies that consistently show facilitators, not the individuals being facilitated, control the written output. Nine systematic reviews show no reliable evidence from proponents or critics that FC or RPM produce independent communication, and further prompts cannot be faded because the facilitator is the source of the type messages. 
facilitators are told that the test situations are clinical and adversarial and for the individuals being tested much too stressful to produce accurate information. Here's an image of my student, her mother and Howard Shane demonstrating a low tech picture identification activity for frontlines prisoners of silence. Um, during the actual testing, he taped images into the file folder and after showing me a picture, he'd show my student either the same picture or flip it down to reveal a, a different picture on the reverse side. I saw no indications that my student was stressed out or demeaned in any way. The environment was familiar to her, the evaluator was respectful, and the test protocols contained pictures of everyday objects and the questions asked were gleaned from information about her and her family's life, things she would know or have been exposed to, but I would not. I later learned that Howard even gave her a secret code to stop the testing whenever she wanted, the ASL sign for stop. The goal was not to test or challenge her intellectual ability. It was to determine how much influence the facilitator had over the type sessions. This type of activity has been rec replicated in many situations with individuals always matched with their most successful facilitator. Every effort has been made to ensure success, but the technique simply does not work. Facilitators, when asked, felt the testing went as expected and only complained about the test situation after they learned the result that they were the ones that were doing the typing. Whoop. Um, control tests are the only reliable way to determine authorship and it's the only form of testing proponents aggressively avoid. When facilitators are blinded to test protocols, the correct FC generated responses are based on information the facilitators are given during the testing. Information seen only by the client result in responses that are one, falsely correct. And these are words that are spelled correctly but have nothing to do with the information that the student was um, provided. In other words, facilitator guesses. Two, they're unintelligible, typed gibberish, or three, there's no response or there's a blank. As with um, a few preceding tests and dozens to follow, the testing I participated in showed the messages with the facilitator's mind and not those of the student. It, um, it's an extraordinarily uncomfortable situation to realize that despite being well-intentioned, the messages generated by these techniques are fabrications regardless of content. Um, this is why facilitators don't want to be tested. I think in the past, researchers have underestimated the psychological hold FC and RPM have on the facilitators. This is a belief system we're talking about and not a communication technique, but this is changing as people from all disciplines come together to talk about the issue. With current facilitators refusing to participate in double blind testing, we're left with pro FC and RPM videos and movies to give us a glimpse of facilitator control and influence. This is in addition to physical cueing we've seen previously. <clears throat> I'll just give you a couple examples from a pro FC movie called Wretches and Jabberers with facilitators trained by Bicklin at Syracuse University before I move into why I think FC still exists and where the messages come from. Here the person being facilitated says one thing, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, while typing. I've always been very angry about my autism. I didn't get seen as intelligent until I was out of high school. Now I've asked communication experts in the field if it's common for individuals to be saying one thing and typing another, and the answer is no. Here, a different facilitator and his client are typing together. And in this case, the individual with autism has some basic literacy skills and can speak. And in this example, we get an idea of what the individual does and does not understand. The bold letters are what the individual typed during facilitation and then immediately read aloud. And so the words he knew were people move away from, and then later with ice cold. The rest of the words, were typed during facilitation and read by the facilitator because the client didn't know what had just been written. People move away from psychologically negative space to jovial state of mind with using humor motivation to stay calm and loosening my tension with ice cold Budweiser. 
he read um, the individual guest beer for the last word, so he can recognize letters in the initial positions of words. Um, he read Budweiser after a verbal cue from the facilitator. Again, I asked the experts if it is usual for someone to be able to type complex sentences independently and then not be able to read the words immediately afterwards, and the answer is no. In addition, the word choices are not expected. Who really talks like this? And do not reflect the level of language comprehension hinted at by the words the individual could spell, read, and speak on his own. So why with all the evidence against FC would someone continue to use it? It's my belief that facilitators are emotionally primed to quote unquote, make it work. FC is marketed even by proponents as a technique of last resort and parents turning to FC are disillusioned by evidence based measures, which have been proven to help individuals with severe motor and communication difficulties, but are not miracle cures. It's a hard truth that not every human being has the capacity to learn to speak or write at sophisticated levels, but parents are lured in by anecdotes of proponents working with clients like their own children, who once considered incapable of functional communication are suddenly mainstreamed into regular ed classrooms, attending college, presenting at the United Nations, writing books or producing movies. And proponents like Soma claim to have a 100% success rate Soma is the founder of Rapid Prompting Method, a variant of FC heavily promoted in a 2009 movie called A Mother's Courage. Here Soma is using RPM and spelling out words with an individual who's not looking at the letter board, a child whose native language is not English, but within a few weeks was purportedly writing full, grammatically correct sentences in a language he was never formally taught. Douglas Bicklin reported a slightly less grandiose success rate in a 2002 court case, saying facilitator influence was anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. Still, this raises the question of 60 to 80, of which 60 to 80 percent of FC generated messages in any given typing session are we to believe? That's him in the middle, by the way, looking at the keyboard with his facilitator while the client is looking away from the board and stimming. This image is from a 1991 training video put out by Syracuse University, their ground zero for facilitated communication in the United States and still heavily promote it. Even in the training video, they couldn't follow their own rules of making sure the client had eye contact with the board while typing. This wasn't the only time it happened in the film. And client inattentiveness is a common problem with all facilitators, including the leaders. Again, raising doubts about who has control over the FC generated messages. My question is how much facilitator influence is acceptable and when is it okay to substitute the facilitator's thoughts and feelings for those of the individuals they are facilitating. I wanna take a minute and talk about the facilitator's mindset. We've talked about the emotional pull FC has for parents seeking a simpler solution to their loved one's complex communication needs. But what happens when they give themselves permission to believe the unbelievable, that their child can now type out, I love you for the first time, or can think about attending college instead of spending his or her educational experiences in a life skills classroom. And what happens to an educator who, with the help of FC or RPM, can now connect with and advocate for a student who, has other, who was otherwise difficult to reach? Most, if not all, facilitators are well-meaning individuals. However, a facilitator's mindset is at best defensive and at worst a bit egotistical and close to new information. I think it comes from fiercely protecting the illusion of FC and needing to be right. Proponents have done a good job over the years convincing themselves that people who criticize the techniques of FC and RPM are against individuals with disabilities setting up an us against them frame of mind. I've met many of the major critics of FC in the US by the way, and some in other parts of the world. And I can safely say that not one of them are against individuals with disabilities. On the contrary, they have spent their careers developing techniques and methods to help these individuals progress in their abilities to communicate independently, 
whatever their skills or physical capabilities. FC proponents are a close knit group though, and they largely seek each other out to uh, confirm the efficacy of FC and RPM. This picture is from a group called Save by Typing, an organization founded by parents who support each other and FC, as well as evangelize its use because they themselves have experienced it and believe it works. If this hasn't raised alarm bells for you, it should since AAC methods and techniques are based on evidence and not on a deep seated feeling or belief. Over time, facilitators come to identify themselves as communication partners or interpreters and lose sight of the fact that the typed words are their own and not those of the cl their clients or loved ones. Most people don't start out as true believers. It's only through practice and perceived successes that change people's minds. Daniel Wegner, the researcher I mentioned earlier, says you only have to believe it could work to increase the chances that it will work. From the start, the facilitators are asking students to give answers to multiple choice questions, closed sentences or fill in the blanks or personal questions the facilitators know already. Their clients' names, addresses, family members, favorite foods and the like. They're not taught about the idiomotor response in the trainings and are told not to question the responses. So when answers are typed, facilitators remember the correct responses or the hits and naturally want to keep practicing. They also receive a personal psychological boost for succeeding with FC, feeling special that the individual being facilitated trusted them enough to share in the activity. The movie Autism is a World is an emotional and telling scene, how this transformation in mindset takes place. Up until this point, the mother was somewhat skeptical of FC, though she hoped it could work, and here's how she describes it. I asked her if she could type three vegetables, and you can see it was really difficult for her to get anything, and it just looked like gibberish to me. I saw that she was doing SPSI, SPI, and so I said to her, do you mean spinach? And then she got it. She typed spinach. So then I said to her, one more and you can go. She typed kale. I have no idea where that came from because I never buy kale. I don't like kale. I don't make kale. She's never had kale, but anyway, she typed kale. In other words, the facilitator, in this case, the mother typed out a word she knew, but her daughter didn't and used it as proof of independent communication. It's how, it's how the training works. That's how you're taught to do things. I happen to think most facilitators are conscientious and wanna do right by their clients or loved ones. They stick to the guidelines, some of which I've reposted here. If facilitators expect to see unusual spellings, they're gonna find them in the typed responses. They're not going to attribute bad spelling to facilitator inattentiveness. If they are expecting unusual word order, they're not gonna reject a sentence that has unusual word order. They call it poetry and move on. Over time, the facilitation process itself becomes more fluid, rapid even, which is taken as a sign of effectiveness. And the sentence structures lengthen from words to phrases to sentences, and in some cases to whole books. The expectation of facilitators is that at some point their client will be capable of producing conversations using FC and RPM that is commensurate with typically developed speaking individuals. That's the promise of FC. Remember the leaders set a success rate anywhere from 60 to 100%. Those are amazing odds given that evidence-based methods do not make those kinds of guarantees and facilitators really wanna make this work. If you've made the leap of faith that FC quote unquote works, you're gonna start treating the messages as real and not fabrications. Along with the guidelines on how to prove authorship, facilitators also set up their own tests for authenticity. Say there are two choices for lunch today, pizza or hamburger. And through um, facilitation, the student types out pizza. When she gets to the lunch counter, the student chooses a pizza, so the facilitator counts it as a correct type message. But what if the student chooses a hamburger instead? Clearly, the FC message typed out was wrong, right? Nope. The facilitator rationalizes that the typed answer pizza 
was still correct, but the student changed her mind on the way to the cafeteria. The facilitator asked the student if she changed her mind and the typed answer is yes. And it's another successful hit. In this example, by the way, the only true communication was the individual choosing by herself what she wanted for lunch. This type of rationalization can be seen from the inception of FC in Bicklin's Communication Unbound. He wrote, several facilitators, including speech therapists, teachers, and parents encountered difficulty identifying the store source of certain communication. Either it had been generated by the person being supported or by their own unconscious selection cueing. They reported instances where they had believed the communication to be genuine, only to discover that it reflected their own subtle cues. Instead of honoring the facilitator's doubts and setting up protocols to rule out facilitator influence, Bicklin went on to wonder if there were perfectly reasonable explanations for the quote unquote incorrect communications. Note the word incorrect is in quotation marks. So he's casting doubt on what the facilitators deep down knew then, and I believe know now to be true that they are authoring the messages. One, one example Bicklin mentions is a teenager named Bet who types out that her name is Elizabeth. It's confirmed later that her name is actually Beth, B-E-T-H, and her friends call her Bet, B-E-T-T-E. Instead of recognizing this was a case of facilitator control, Bicklin surmises that maybe Bet likes the name Elizabeth better and is quote unquote claiming it as her own. Another student, Geraldine, types out the wrong home address. Again, instead of recognizing this as a case of facilitator control, he offers an explanation that maybe Geraldine didn't know the answer, but made up a response so that she'd at least have some answer for the question. He goes on to write that both girls were provided incorrect information in these instances, communicated independently in other conversations with only the support of a hand on the shoulder or a finger touching the thread of a sweater. Again, incorrect is in quotation marks, and he defines independent communication as being touched at the shoulder or on a piece of clothing, something we know subjects the person being facilitated to, to cueing by the facilitator. So quite effectively, the facilitator's insightful doubts about FC are squelched and the incorrect answers accepted or rationalized away. This was another missed opportunity in my mind to set up blinded testing and make sure that the communications they were producing at the center were actually the words of the students. Remember, this was one of the founders of FC and he repeatedly missed opportunities, willfully or not, to respond to facilitators doubts and test the technique. This approach of minimizing facilitator introspection in lieu of accepting any typed answers is modeled throughout the workshops and leads facilitators to believe that all communications generated through FC are real if they can think of an alternate explanation for a wrong answer. Proponents might point out that this is an old report and therefore not relevant to the, today's quote unquote new and improved versions of FC and RPM but this type of thinking is the bedrock of these techniques and remains intact today. If the messages aren't the words of individuals with disabilities, then where do the message come from? This is probably the most difficult question to answer because one, people don't want to think this is true of themselves or others, and two, we want FC and RPM to be true. But based on my experience, the people I've talked with, the literature I've read, the messages come from within facilitators themselves. The writings of FC have a close relationship with automatic writing, which is, was popularized in the early 1900s by spiritualists, as well as surrealist artists and poets who use the planchette to tap into their own unconscious. It requires an ability to dissociate in the same way that writers get into a zone when they're working on a manuscript. My guess is that critics of FC don't easily reach this state, so that's why FC and RPM doesn't work for everyone. People ask if the stories that facilitators tell are their own stories or if they're unconscious thoughts. And to that, I say yes and no. Um, I think the thoughts are, are non-conscious rather than unconscious, but psychologists might think otherwise. And by this, I mean that facilitators are reacting to their environment 
the individual they're working with, their thoughts about what the individual might be thinking or what it's like to be a person with limited spoken and written abilities, plus their own personal experiences. Sometimes they're responding to what letters are being touched accidentally or purposefully on the board. And sometimes they're reacting to questions or comments from individuals outside the facilitator client dyad. I do believe there is a willful ignorance when it comes to questioning FC production. Facilitators actively avoid testing the messages in any meaningful way. And this adds to the self-deception facilitators experience. If facilitators don't ask the question of who's controlling the messages or test it in any meaningful way, they don't have to admit to themselves that their child or client may not have the sophisticated language or literacy skills they hoped for. However, this doesn't mean their child or client can't communicate in some way. Language, literacy, and communication are three different things. It just means that FC and RPM don't work and that's a difficult thing to accept when you're told by those you you view as experts that this is a technique of last resort. I wanna discuss uh, or describe a scene to you from a movie called the, A Mother's Courage in which Somer's working with a group of students sitting around a table. The idea is for all of the students to tell her one good thing about themselves. In each case, she holds the board for the individuals and calls, them out, calls out the letters and the individuals are holding pencils to point to the board. The first individual she goes to has his eyes closed, but they type out S-M-A-R-T. To Soma, that's a successful exchange and she attributes it to the individual. The next person she cues with a thumb on his shoulder and he types out on camera C-T-I-O-N. She says, quick action. So he takes actions very quickly, another successful exchange. The third person she approaches turns his head away from the board and they type N-O-T-M and the pencil slips and it looks like it just happens to get stuck in the U. They finish the word CH. People in the room laugh and Soma says, no, I don't think you have to feel bad, not much. You're good in math, you're funny. Again, this is considered an, a successful exchange. And the last person types out ST. The board is um, visibly moving up and down and side to side. Soma, Soma says, okay, stock. Oh, Mitch is a stockbroker. And they type out B-R-O-K-E-R. -E she says again, Mitch is a stockbroker. Note that many of these responses cannot objectively be proven, but are still accepted as legitimately spelled out by individuals who are not consistently looking at the board or had their eyes closed. The not much answer received a laugh, proving a sense of humor and the stockbroker answer was unexpected and therefore taken as proof of authorship. At no time does the facilitator ask the individuals for confirmation, the assist like assistants do with AAC, and there's no outward indication that the individuals understand the activity or what was being spelled out. But its inclusion in the movie alludes to the fact that people who witnessed the session believed the written output was true. Um, once facilitators start believing the FC generated messages, all topics of conversation are on the table, including finances, uh, religion, relationships, education, health, politics, you name it. Facilitators are told in the trainings to expect that individuals with um, may disclose information about abuses. And I think this plays a significant role in claims of false allegations of abuse. By the mid 1990s, there were five dozen and there, there have been abuses um, since then, though it's hard to calculate the numbers because many of them are settled out of court. But there was, there was one in 2018 in Florida that um, made the newspapers. Um, I was involved in a false abuse case. And in my case, I felt the trust was broken when my student started hitting and scratching me. In all likelihood, I was sitting too close to her or the FC sessions had gone on beyond what she was able to tolerate. But unfortunately, I made the erroneous mental leap that she's acting out or something must be happening at home. And once that seed is planted, regardless of the content, that idea may play out on the page in one way or the other. People ask how the disclosures become so graphic. I don't know if I have a complete answer for this. Um, 
but I do believe that situation plays a huge role in the content of typed messages. If you're in the cafeteria, for example, the FC conversation is likely to focus on food or whatever topics come up with the student and or friends. If you're in study hall, you might talk about what subject the student is supposed to be working on. In a DHS interview for suspected abuses, facilitators know the seriousness of the topic. Authorities ask who, what, where, when, how many times, etc., and the story plays out on the page. I don't know how other facilitators in this situation think. I'm the only person worldwide that I know of who has been in this um, experience, who's had this experience and speaks about it publicly, but I had never been in a DHS interview. I'd been taught to believe what was on the page and I was reacting to the situation. I'll also add that fluency in FC does not necessarily mean any of the output is based in fact. Going through the double blind testing and gaining access to evidence based reports about FC helped me accept the fact that I authored the messages, but it was not an easy road. I could just as easily have told myself that I needed more training and turned to the FC community for answers, which is what many facilitators in my case um, or had similar kinds of testing needs did instead of accepting the truth. In the end, the science made more sense than what I learned in the FC workshops. I understood intellectually the problems of FC long before the emotional effects of the experience came into balance. It still at times causes me a great sadness as and is in part why I continue to speak out. It's not an experience I wish on anyone. False allegations of abuse and facilitated crimes have an impact, not just on individuals with disabilities and their families, but law enforcement, educators, social workers, and perhaps less recognized the facilitators themselves who have been led by universities and other reputable organizations to believe that FC and RPM are legitimate forms of communication, which I will say again, they are not. As an aside, I'm held up as an example of a quote unquote bad facilitator by proponents who wanna distance themselves from the truth about FC, that all facilitators, regardless of duration of their training or the type content control the messages. This is typical of cult-like organizations. They wanna distance themselves from the bad news. I'm not exaggerating when I say there are no facilitators who can avoid queuing, however well-meaning they are or how many hours they've practiced, queuing is built into the techniques. They can't help it. I understand it's a big psychological ask to have people change a deeply held belief system, but the fact is by 1994-95, FC was thoroughly discredited by researchers, psychologists, and educators who replicated the tests like the one I participated in and invalidated FC because of the high degree of facilitator control over the messages, 100%. The latest authorship study was done in 2014 and it showed exactly the same results. Um, I couldn't resist putting this comment in. I kind of, it, it, it made me laugh and also feel very sad for the, the facilitator. Um, it was left on an article reporter Michael Burke wrote for the Syracuse student newspaper, The Daily Orange, in which I was interviewed about how facilitators control words typed in FC without realizing it. This was just one small part of the, the comment. And the commenter here claims that the article is bullshit and that um, she and a colleague are facilitators who um, never controlled the FC generated messages. I'm guessing neither have gone through double blind testing. So it's for me, it's a little bit hard to take this comment seriously. What I do find ironic though, is that later she goes on to say that um, she reveals that her own husband saw FC in action and she asked why her friend, the other facilitator mentioned here was moving the kid's hand. And that's the power of self-deception. And I wanna say that I absolutely empathize with her. I believe she truly cares about the individuals she works with, but I do find that she's misguided in her belief and facilitated communication. But you don't have to take any my word for this, any of this. Um, these are just some of the organizations with statements opposing FC and rapid prompting method. They've done their own systematic reviews and determined that FC and RPM proponents 
have failed to produce reliable evidence to back up their claims of independent communication. They cite concerns over facilitator influence, prompt dependency, and documented harms, like false allegations of abuse, and strongly urge their members not to engage in these techniques. Some organizations like the International Society of Augmentative and Alternative Communication call FC a human rights violation. FC and its variants do have an active presence in Canada. There have been false allegations of abuse cases and within the past few years, some individuals using a variant of RPM called Spelling to Communicate have tried but failed to get its use in at least one Canadian school. Out of curiosity, I emailed some organizations in Canada before this talk, Speech Language and Audiology Canada and the Canadian Pediatric Society currently do have statements opposing FC, though some of the other speech language and autism organizations do not. I sent information to one of the applied behavior analysis organizations who don't have a statement, a statement but they said they'd research the issue and get back to me. In closing, um, based on my experience and the advice of experts working in the fields of communication, autism, and psychology, and the evidence-based research accumulated over the past 30 plus years, I would not accept one facilitated word as truth without proof of authorship. FC and its variants are not standardized or licensed practices and controlling tests is not a requirement. I would encourage those listening to advocate for regulations to be put in place and for pro proponents to produce reliable evidence of their claims or stop the practice altogether. Uh, you can get more information on our new website, facilitatedcommunication.org, which includes references for controlled studies, systematic reviews, critiques of FC, documentation of false abuse cases and facilitated crimes and more. The email there is contact at facilitatedcommunication.org. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Well done, Janice. I've got tons of questions. Are you I ready? <laughs> I knew I figured it would, but uh, such an interesting topic. And so you could go so far. Uh, just to, to let people know, just recently I went to a facilitated communication conference, was it, that was held last week, a webinar? And Janice was one of the speakers. It's fascinating. I, I've listened to this and I learn something new every time. It's just amazing and astounding. One of the things that Janice and I talked about today, and I'm hoping people can put it maybe in the chat or somehow let us know, is how many people have actually heard about facilitated communication before today? Or, and so people are putting their hands up because it was cer certainly something as an educator I heard in the 90s. And, but I thought like many, it had long gone. So it was interesting, but I'm going to start off here uh, with some people uh, uh, with comments as well as questions. And Jim Cox had a really good comment, I thought. He says it's shooting the arrow and drawing a circle around it, <laughs> or just drawing the target around it. I thought that was very appropriate. And uh, so Neil also asks you, how did you feel when you realized that the process was terribly flawed? Oh, it was horrible. Um... It, I actually, I, I want to say that going through the double blind testing didn't um, change my mind right away. It took a, it took a while. Um, actually, it took somebody saying to me, um, how many, how many more people have to get hurt before you stop doing this? Yeah. And um, I also got access at about the same time to, to um, some double blind testings that were just coming out. I got involved with facilitated communication about a year after it was introduced into the United States. So there weren't all these studies, but there were enough. And it was, it was a really confusing time to, for me because, I mean, I think of myself as a well-meaning person and I was hoping that I was helping out and it just turned into this terrible train wreck that was horrible. I caused a lot of problems for, for people, um, including myself. And um, it sort of shook my, my belief in, in education in a way. The, our local university was promoting it. Um, they still believe in it. There's some people on staff there that still believe in it. Um, wow. And I didn't have, um, I didn't really have a support system 
um, to figure it out. Um, people like everywhere, like the pro FC people distanced themselves from me and the skeptics were like, how could you ever believe in this? And I was just like, oh my God, you know, how am I going to figure this out? Um, fortunately, Howard Shane, um, he did the double blind testing. He kept in touch with me and John Palferman from, um, he, he did the 1993 documentary about FC called Prisoners of Silence. And both those people stayed in touch with me to some degree. I'm friends with Howard now. Um, and I think there was like a window of time where I could have, I could have said one of two things. I could have said, okay, maybe I am the bet. Cause that's what the FC people immediately came out and said, well, she must've been trained poorly. Even one of the people that trained me came out on television and said she was poorly trained. <laughs> and so what do you say to that? You know? Um, and so um, I, I could have, I could have, believed that and said, I will get more training because that's what a lot of facilitators in my situation have done, yeah. including Rosemary Crosley, who's the leader of, of um, FC in Australia. Her, she and, and eight of her facilitators had false allegations of abuse cases and they're still using FC. Or I could have gone, well, I want to, I mean, I was, I was exposed to the, the, um, the ODHEC Center in New York was a, a, a center for autism and they did a study, a blind test on their students. It wasn't the same, it wasn't false allegations of abuse. They were just trying to figure out what was going on. And all they had, I think they had six or eight facilitators and they had hundreds of chances to be right. And it was all based on the facilitators. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I started seeing that, the, the veil started falling away. Um, so fortunately for me, during that window, when I was still um, open to information, I got the science and, and I understood it. And, and the emotional stuff has taken years to figure out. But uh, I knew by, by the time in 1993, by the time Prisoners of Silence aired, I knew FC was, couldn't work. It just, it can't work the way that it's being, it can't be independent. It can't be. Yeah. So. And but that, it was horrible. I mean, I still feel bad about it. If oh, I could go back yeah. and, and, you know, change things, um, but I can't. So the best thing I feel like I can do is um, there's a part of my brain, you know, I, I wasn't trained to not get into the situation, but I was trained that if something goes wrong, you, you try to figure out what happened and why. And that's, that's been my approach and it's led me to where I am now. And, and that's, you know, I know that by speaking out, I've helped some people. Um, there, there's an abuse case going on right now. I can't really say much about it, but just um, to get a phone call saying this is still happening is just devastating. It's just mm -hmm. hard. And, and that leads, because you talk quite a bit uh, in your talk as well as just now about the double blinding. And there's a, a question from Larry, I believe it was, that said, what exactly did, can you describe the double blind test in more detail? How did it oh, exactly happen? Sure, sure. The way that I, the way that uh, I had three activities that I can remember, it's like 30 years ago. So um, one, one was I was shown a picture and she was shown a picture and sometimes they were the same and sometimes they were different. And then we were asked to type out what we saw and all the, all the responses were based on what I saw. And that's true of every single controlled testing that's been done. It's been hundreds of people, hundreds of facilitators, and it's always that's always what happens. Or they're or they're 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 typed words that are spelled correctly, but they have nothing to do with the activity. So, um, so you get shown two different things then. Yeah, there's like yeah. a very interesting. Yeah. So the other thing that they uh, that Howard did was he asked me a series of questions based on what um, Betsy's life, uh, the, my student's life, um, that I wouldn't know. Like, what color is Uncle So and So's car? What's your favorite toy when you get home? What do you like to eat on Sundays with? poppy or whatever you know what I, i'm making that up but that's the kind of questions something i would know i didn't know at all and so those were those were again based on my guesses or or blank um and then the last thing 
um, Howard took her out into the hallway. He showed her a key, put it in her hand, said, this is a key. And then they came back in and, and um, said that, um, what did you see in the hallway? Of course, no response. And then he pulled out the key from his pocket. What is this? And we typed out key. So she had a chance to type out key if she, she, if she knew how to do that. But interesting. she didn't know how yeah. to do that. Very so, interesting. Thanks.